you and I probably travel more in a couple weeks than 90% of people would have traveled in an entire year a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and so all of these, you know, again, all, all of these glues or mortars for the bricks that held church and society and family together, uh, they're all just like wiped away so rapidly. This is one reason, you know, because I, I always say it's like transgenderism is a terrible evil, but it's the same train we boarded in the 1800s. A logical you know, conclusion. It's not a, it's not a new train. Um, it's just the same train still barreling down the track. And most people want to go back. Well, they want the 1980 version of that train. Um, or they want the 1950 version of that train. I'm like, I want a completely new train. Yeah. I don't want to be on this train at all. My guest this week is John Moody, and he's a Christ follower, husband, father, farmer, entrepreneur, homesteader, co-founder of the Rogue Food Conference, and so much more. I think he's cracked the full code about how Christian men have reached this unique moment of historical crisis. And as a result, John has the best vision of how to proceed. He's discovered about how the productive Christian household has been ripped apart piece by piece for at least the past 130 years. And what preceded this process was the corruption of America's foremost theological institutions, the elite East Coast universities like Harvard and Princeton. In other words, we didn't just arrive here overnight, starting in 2020. As I've said many times, 2020 was when open war was declared on humanity, but the opposing force had been quietly massing its armies for much longer. So after we answer the question, how did we get here? The next logical question is, what do we do? I think John provides excellent answers to both questions, not just by blogging, but by example. Rebuilding a productive household with six kids, a loving wife, and the feds and big agriculture making threats because he's found the true weak points in the infrastructure, food. And to that point, let me say, food is the weak point in the Christian infrastructure as well. Gluttonous sinners abound wearing their sins around their waistline. And so now, more than ever, it's important that real deal Christian men begin asking questions, what are we eating? Where did it come from? And how can we do better, feel better, witness better, and thereby build better for the inevitable storms ahead? You're about to hear an interview that's lived rent-free in my head since we finished recording, because it shows the clearest way forward that I've heard for men like John, who are courageous and bold enough to walk it. In our conversation, John and I discussed fundamentalism versus modernism, volition as the core of personhood, revivalist preachers and celebrity culture, using your body according to the instructions, reintegrating your household, the quote, better life of the boomer, and the floodgates of European perversion. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Please like this video, share it, and subscribe. Plus, leave a comment down below letting us know what you thought about the Herbert Hoover quote. And please welcome this week's guest on the podcast, a Christ follower, husband, father, author, entrepreneur, farmer, and more, and a man we should all be listening closely to, John Moody. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, it's great to see you in person after enjoying um, so some of the, shall we say, fireworks you create on Twitter. Oh, the feeling is mutual, sir. <laughs> I quite enjoy being fire starters together. So um, that is actually uh, one of the reasons I've been so excited to have this conversation, because it seems that uh, outspoken, faithful Christian men that speak directly into the heart of so many of the issues that we're facing today and do so unapologetically are in short supply. And I'm very grateful when I encounter men like you who do that so fearlessly because they're, they're few. So I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation as well to, to talk about some of those issues. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it, it kills me because, you know, like, you know, I just, I look around um, and, you know, you have abortion, which has morphed into genital mutilation of kids and the most pressing issue on tw on Twitter the past few days has been Doug Wilson's use of dirty words. 
Um, yes. And I'm, I'm just like, like, I cannot take any of you men seriously. Yeah. Where you're going to waste an entire week. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm just like, like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You know, is this really the thing that, um, like attracts your bandwidth and energy? Mm -hmm. And if so, like, why, <laughs> like, what is wrong with you that this is what you, you know, this is what animates you to finally, you know, spill ink and spill blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's one of the things I've been struggling to figure out because I think the same attitude shows up in so many different ways. This kind of chastising finger wagging, like that's not very Christian kind of energy that seems to pervade the church. And I'm relatively new in the faith and I don't really fully understand it, but it seems to be one of the defining characteristics to be of being an American Christian is being constantly policed by scolding school marms who are making sure that you behave the right way. Yeah. And you know, for your, have, for your listeners, have you talked about some of the history of evangelicalism, you know, um, you know, especially you look at like the early 1800s, um, the prohibition movement who bankrolled prohibition, how they targeted women. Mm -hmm. um, you also have the errant theology that probably predates the 1800s. But one reason women were the easy target for prohibition was this idea that, um, you know, men are inherently carnal. Mm -hmm. And women are inherently spiritual, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you really see this in some of the neo-paganism in our culture um, because the women are the witches and the sages and all of these other, because women are inherently in tune with the spiritual. Mm -hmm. and, and so that kind of 1800s, early 1900s, um, you know, really did a number on church culture in America. And then, you know, you get to the 1960s, 1970s, the fundamentalist modernist controversy, along with the sexual revolution. And you layer over that, um, you know, the, the final impacts of the industrial revolution. And you basically have what we have today is churches full of women of both genders <laughs> and very, very few men to be found anymore. Um, in, in almost all mainline churches, but that has, um, steadily spread into the evangelical and reformed world as well. Hmm. Yeah. The, um, the, I had a guest on my podcast named, uh, professor Nancy Piercy, and she wrote a book uh -huh. called the toxic war on masculinity. And in that book she talks about, which was hugely informative for me about how the switch of the moral the moral center of gravity of America went from the father to the mother in the 1800s due to prohibition, you know, and, and, and that whole movement. But what I'm not familiar with, and that was really powerful to see because I, I come from the neo-pagan kind of world. Um, that, and so my, my, my audience will know that whole story. But what I'm not familiar with is the fundamentalist modernist controversy of the 1960s. That's, those are a couple terms that I, that I haven't heard. So what was, what was going on there? Let's start there. Yeah, are you familiar with Grisham Macon or Machen? Yes, as some people uh, Christian and liberalism is on the way from Amazon right now. Yeah, so so when you read that book, it'll be great. Um, okay, and, and you know this kind of understands un, under, oh, this helps <laughs> explain one of the other splits that you and I end up interacting with people on Twitter over, um, kind of this sacred secular split. You okay. know, so basically, um. You know, so so you have liberalism in European universities, um, really like modernism, postmodern thought in European universities. Let's you know, ju just ballparking all of this, late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. uh, so European churches were riddled with liberalism, modernity, postmodernity, long before American churches. Um, but uh, most American professors were educated in Europe. Oh, um, so okay. if you wanted to be a professor, 
at a seminary like Harvard and Princeton, because your readers may or listeners may not know, like all of the major universities in America were originally founded by denominations to be training grounds for um, pastors and then other careers that were um, supposed to be shaped by God's word and God's law. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, so all of these major institutions, Princeton, Harvard, you know, th these were all originary, originally um, seminary type institutions because theology, I can't remember if it was like four or five doc, you know, the, the five doctores, you know, like law, medicine, theology. Mm -hmm. um, so theology 150, 200 years ago was considered a discipline as worthy and difficult as being a doctor or being a lawyer in terms of the level of education. Uh, and so when you would study to be a professor of theology, you would go do your studies over in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you would go to Europe, um, conservative, not politically speaking here, I'm speaking right. um, in terms of theology and other worldview type matters, and you'd come back a liberal. Mm. Um, one of the most striking stories of this is, I believe it was Toy. Um, so Toy is a famous New Testament scholar. He was a professor at Southern Seminary. Okay. And to become a professor at Southern Seminary, you have to sign the abstract of principles, which is the doctrinal statement of the school. And Toy, I believe, wrote in his own journal that he signed it with his fingers crossed behind his back. Oh, that's, that's not going to um, go so well for you. You know, so um, all of the mainline and larger Protestant denominations in America from the late 1800s into the middle 1900s lost all of their seminaries to postmodern, um, higher critical, reader response, um, Jesus seminar type wacko professors who were educated over in Europe. And oh. they came back and started educating the pastors in America. And then the pastors drove the mainline denominations right, not just into a ditch, but all the way down to the third level of hell. Um, wow. And, and so the fundamentalist modernist controversy was that the final remnants of strong conservative leadership who were trying to uphold the inerrancy of the Bible, the sufficiency of the scriptures, the original authorship of the Bible, that the Bible was authored by God and then the men the books are attributed to are who wrote those books. Um, all of these kind of core basic doctrinal issues, um, the fundamentalists went to war against the modernists. So, you know, fundamentalism is a pejorative yeah. at this point, uh, but originally it basically just meant somebody who believed the fundamental doctrinal teaching of the church Back to, you know, things like the Westminster Standards, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, um, the creeds, the divinity of Christ, the, you know, um, all, all of these basic doctrinal things. But one of the things that shook out in that battle um, was, you know, a lot of the modernist churches had bought into the social gospel. Um that what saves you isn't the atoning work of Christ on the cross. It's doing good works. You mm -hmm. know, Jesus is the ultimate example of good works. <laughs> um, so, so this really um, created a sacred secular rift in America between the, the few remaining conservative denominations and then the bulk of liberalizing Christianity um, where, you know, we are focusing on the spiritual, the doctrinal, and they are the ones who are the environmentalists. They are the ones who care about poverty. Um, and, and none of that is scriptural because it's social gospel. And, and so 
this created this kind of rift where the Bible does not have a rift uh, because they were just going at it. I, I saw this rift firsthand years ago because when I was a student at Southern Seminary in Louisville, uh, one of the pastors of the biggest remaining liberal Baptist church in Louisville um, was invited to come to my theology class. It was like a two-hour theology class. And we got to have a dialogue with him for two hours. And, and you really saw like they had completely jettisoned any doctrinal biblical foundation for Christianity. Uh, Christianity is not what you believe, but it's do you love your neighbor? Mm -hmm. And well, loving your neighbor just happens to mean whatever really you want it to mean at this point, because there is no Bible um, to constrain it, because any verse in the Bible other than love your neighbor that we think isn't loving your neighbor, well, Jesus clearly couldn't have said that. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so, so you have this, you know, Piercy's good at pointing out, um, you, you know, that, that the inversion of male, female views and roles in the 1800s. Another great place you see this is books. Um, books written um, in the mid and early 1800s about like family are almost exclusively addressed to men. Okay. And by the, you know, by the late, you know, 1920s, 1930s, books are almost exclusively addressed to women. Family books. Um, yeah, family books. You know, so you couple all this as well with the Industrial Revolution, and um, you've eroded almost every foundational pillar of what a household is biblically. So you've eroded the ordering of the household. You've eroded the purpose of the household. Um, you know, and and all of these things just swept through in a hundred years. And very few men, um, you know, even really stood back to think about it, let alone try and do something to what was happening. Well, that is a land speed record for blowing my mind. Um, there's lots of lots of different stuff that I, I want to dig into on that. that. This puts together a bunch of missing pieces for me because I've been trying to figure out how did the American evangelical church get into the state that it's in? And Piercy's historical analysis of the 1800s was a big piece that I didn't know when I read her book. And I've been trying to figure out what happened in the 20th century. And somehow feminism alone didn't seem like a sufficient explanation that somehow in the 1960s, even though it's been, you know, what, 60 years since then, or even you can wind it back to the 50s, somehow just that explanation alone didn't seem enough. It seemed like the infiltration and the corruption must have happened before then. And it sounds like that was the case. And the battle was already happening in the 1960s. And which means that by that point, you know, when you have the cultural reinforcements of, of the full court press of feminism and neo-paganism and environmentalism, et cetera, crushing in on the weak, already weakened church, no wonder they capitulated, and that's why we are where we are today. Is that is that kind of about right? Like the stru internal structures have been weakened from Harvard yeah. and Princeton, et cetera, well before, and then they just there was like yeah. a, a, a more or less controlled demolition after. Yeah, yeah. You you no longer had um, you had wolves guarding the sheep mm -hmm. instead of shepherds uh, driving out the wolves. And then, you know, if we're going to, I'm going to hit on just one more aspect of this for you to eventually chew on. Mm. The, the other thing that got poured over all of these changes was novel eschatology. Uh. Um, so, dispen so, so then you add to all of this, uh, well, the whole world's going to be burned up anyway, and Jesus is coming back a week from Tuesday. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if I weigh 350 pounds. And Let's all go. these other things, <laughs> you, you know, you know, so it was really just like, um, you, you know, it, it was, it was so many things hitting salt all at once, culturally, church wise, technologically, 
Um, again, you know, most people just don't grasp how much the industrial revolution yeah. changed the nature of human relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I, you and I probably travel more in a couple weeks than 90% of people would have traveled in an entire year a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and so all of these, you know, again, all, all of these glues or mortars for the bricks that held church and society and family together, uh, they're all just like wiped away so rapidly. Um, and, and this is one reason, you know, because I, I always say it's like transgenderism is a terrible evil, um, but, but it's, um, it's the same train we boarded in the 1800s. A logical you know, conclusion. It's not a, it's not a new train. Um, it's just the same train still barreling down the track. And most people want to go back. Well, they want the 1980 version of that train. Um, or they want the 1950 version of that train. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want a completely new train. Yeah. I don't want to be on this train at all. Yes. That's, and that's, that's the, that's the thing that a lot of people struggle with is, oh, can we just rewind the clock to like the 1980s? It's like, no, that was, it was done in the eighties, right? That, that was, that was when I grew up. And, and yeah. one of the things I've had to do lately, there are actually, and I've talked about this a number of times, there are videos on YouTube, compilations of 1980s commercials, right? Yeah. Just like one after another. And these were the commercials that I grew up with that were playing on TV. So I watched them. And I was like, I remember all the nostalgia, you know, like, oh man, parts of my brain activating. I haven't thought about in years. But then I looked at it. I'm like, what's going on here? It's this rampant, mindless, thoughtless, cheap Chinese crap consumerism. The battle was lost by then, right? As we're all yeah. being glutted on fiat food and fiat stuff and the money printer. It's like, I don't want to go back to the 80s, So, but, but about the 50s. Yeah. No, when you look at like Playboy was 1953, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, the Beat Poets, Kerouac, you know, Kinsey, it was over in the 50s, right? No matter how far back you go until decades before the Industrial Revolution, probably even before the Civil War, <laughs> if we want to yeah. go there. Well, and, you know, interestingly, beating back some of these currents, um, I've been reading Carlson's um, book on family cycles in America okay. covering basically 400 years of household and family history cycles in American history. Um, and he points out that early types of pornography mm -hmm. um, were coming into America. Oh, I want to say I might have to go double check. It was either like in the 1680s or 1690s. What? Or 1720s or 1730s from Europe. Like written stuff. Yeah, written stuff. Um, yeah, Marquis de Sade. You know, so, yeah. You know, so like these, um, it, it, you know, it wasn't really until the 1800s that the floodgates of perversion that had taken hold in Europe began to more quickly spread across into American you know, culture and society. And that's partly because of, you know, the lingering impact of the civil war and how the civil war changed the balance of power and culture in America to be much more Northern centric. Mm. And the, the North was much more sympathetic to um, Europe and European influence and European culture. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the great trading centers of the North were completely dependent upon making money by extracting value from the rest of the country and trading it with Europe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's a wild ride when you begin to be like, you know, this, this is how stuff plays out and works over time. Um, and how relatively inconsequential things um, end up over time create, creating, you know, monumental societal change or mo i mean the foundations like it seems sometimes in the way that modernity works is that people are looking for silver bullet kind of solutions right and and yeah. like oh this is going to be the thing that fixes everything or if, if i just pull on this thread 
But the more that I go looking into it, especially looking into things that we're not supposed to go looking into, like you're not supposed to go looking into the, to the, to the civil war, just, you know, just watch the Steven Spielberg Lincoln movie and look at the Lincoln Memorial and don't, don't ask any questions about that because that was just, you know, America defeating a great evil. And like, don't, don't, don't look at, but when you go looking at it and you, and you see that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes, you know, in, in all kinds of ways with who Lincoln was and the central, like the first centralization of this humanistic force, you know, like the government is going to be the one who goes to war to fix this problem. And that's where that idea came from. It's like, you begin to see that the threads that are kind of binding us together as a, as a, as a nation or tearing us apart, I suppose, as a nation are, are much thicker and much older than it appears not dating back to the, the 1960s or even the 1860s with the industrial revolution, but going all the way back to the French revolution, right. And seeing what was going on there. It's like, we're way deeper in it than I think a lot of people recognize. Yeah. Well, and, and the French revolution and its philosophical antecedents, yeah, especially radical individualism, mm-hmm. um, you know, like, Feminism, you know, egal, you know, feminism is just one expression of egalitarianism yep. uh, and individualism. And again, so is like the trans nonsense, um, you know, because because what is feminism at its heart? It's and it's, um, you know, there's no such thing as male and female. That's really what feminism is. Mm-hmm. It's a claim that there really is no such thing as God made them fe- male and female. So once you accept feminism, well, if there is no male and female, well, then why can't I say I'm a male or female or this, you know, why can't, um, everything's just paint by numbers at this point. Um, and so it it is those, you know, antecedents in the philosophy and thinking that underrooted the French revolution, um, you you know, until we take a hard run at, um, some of those sacred cows culturally. And the problem is many of these sacred cows, as we've seen on Twitter, um, are sacred cows to churchmen now. Mm-hmm. You know, um, anytime I make any kind of post saying that um, almost nobody should be allowed to vote, like <laughs> certainly, you know, certainly women should not be allowed to vote, but most men should not be allowed to vote either. I agree. You know, p- p- like, like people just lose their minds. They're like, um, you're so it was on somebody's post on Twitter yesterday. This is such a good encapsulation of, um, this type of thinking. A guy goes, uh, the reason racism and sexism are some of the worst sins okay. is because you devalue an image bearer. So, so, so this is, this is completely French enlightenment thinking. There's nothing, but, but this is a Christian who, and so, well, why is this? Because again, like the, the modern person who is formed by the French enlightenment view of what does it mean to be a person? Well, be, it means your volition, your your ability to choose, mm. your ability to be you. That is what makes you valuable. Mm-hmm. Your mm-hmm. raw, unadulterated, unchecked choice of whatever is what makes you uh, valuable, real. So any societal norm or structure that impinges the untethered choice of an individual is by nature wicked. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so most Christians just can't even begin to think of um, a worldview where no, what makes you you is not your unfeathered choice. It is the design and duties God has imposed. He's stamped on you as his image bearer because that's what it you know like you look at the london baptist confession you look at the reformers you look at the puritans what made them them 
was the the stamp and design of God. They you rarely see them talking about you know like choice and all, all of these other very modern concepts because their value was in fulfilling the duty and design God had made them for in the time they found themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm nodding like people listening can't see it, but like I'm nodding really hard because you've touched on something. You just put words to something that I've been struggling with for a while when in, in my, in my um, explorations of feminism, because the message of feminism seems to be that if a woman doesn't have the right to vote, or the right to earn money outside the home, she's not a person. Her personhood yes. is bestowed by the state, which we would call the merger of like business and business and, and governmental power. And then if you deprive women of the right to vote, and if you deprive them the ability to, the ability to earn an income outside the home, you have to f- deprive them of their essential personhood. And I would say, no, that like none of those things grant personhood inherently themselves. Right? That's not where your personhood comes from. It doesn't come from the ability to make free choices in the marketplace. Your personhood comes from the image stamped on you by God. And there's nothing more controversial to many people than that than to say, like, no, you are imbued with uh, God's image and you have certain duties and responsibilities to him. And, that, and you're, that's the essence of your personhood, not the freedom to make choices in the marketplace. But like in our American culture where uh, this kind of libertarianism you know, f- free will, et cetera, kind of, kind of thing pervades. There's no idea more controversial, I think, than that. So I guess this also makes me think of, um, you mentioned, uh, eschatology, dispensationalism. And, and I see, I noticed that this ties very deeply to like the Arminian versus Calvinistic debate as well. And it seems like that would feed into it. Like, no, I have to I have to choose God. It's not that God chooses me. It's that I choose as yeah. God. I choose God. Is that an expression of the same idea? Yeah. You know, Arminianism as a theological system and then its cultural impact is once again, like the, the radical elevation of self, even at that point above God. Oof. <laughs> awesome. You know, and, and P- Piercy does a good bo- job in one of her books talking about how, revivalism, the great awakenings and, and, and revivalism that came out of that. Um, it, it happened at just the right time um, because, again, it was a very radically individual thing. Mm-hmm. You went to a revival. You were converted. You made a decision for Jesus. You know, like it was, um, you know, and, and that... Um, gave birth to celebrity culture. You know, it's kind of funny that churches complain. Uh, I, I mean, because who are the greatest celebrities in world history uh, other than like kings and stuff, but especially as kings and monarchs began to wax and wane in Europe, you know, because of the French Revolution and mm-hmm. other things. And uh, my son Noah will, will probably get mad at me for the Magna Carta um, all of these things that begin to really roll back royal authority and power and cultural influence. Um, well, one of the main figures that filled the void was these larger than life preachers. Mm. Um, you know, like Spurgeon, I forget I how big his, you know, like, um, uh, but especially in America, like Finney and other revival preachers, they really were the first, for lack of a better term, rock stars, movie stars. Um, and, and, and that gave people a desire to have an experience with somebody larger than life, which again, churches still do this because, you know, if you're going to a church camp or church event, uh, you, you know, we have to have a, a larger than life speaker, like um, this kind of rock star. You, you're not going to get, you know, Ted Mildrew from Second Baptist Church and 472 people, London, Kentucky, to be the speaker because mm-hmm. you need you need a rock star. Mm. Um, so, 
Yeah, you know, so Arminianism revival culture w- was just a- another kind of like knocking out of the legs of a stable and sane society where, uh, you know, my individual choice is not the most sacrosanct thing. You know, this is another way to think about voting. Uh, Because what does voting represent to people? Well, it's I get to choose. I get to be heard. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just radical individualism. Uh, It's not that I have duties to others. It's not that I have, um, you know, so you have people in communities who vote against the good of their community. It's just, you know, it's all this craziness at this point. It's just all about me. Mm Mm-hmm. This is, this is what leads to the insanity of saying, like, I even have the right to destroy, like, because if you run out this notion of radical individualism, radical free choice, like pure libertarianism, you know, which, which says that, like, as long as I'm not doing violence to another person, like physical violence, then it's okay. You know, yeah. which is, which is why there's a general, you mentioned the whole 350 pounds thing right? Why can't, I find it the oddest, I find it to be the oddest uh, cultural taboo that someone is walking around the size of a small planet and it's obvious and we can all see it. No, it's not hiding. And yet you can't say anything to them about an objective material reality, right? And so what you get is like, I have the right to destroy myself. I heard someone call it long tail suicide. I have the right to destroy myself, disfigure my body, you know, pierce, tattoo, go absolutely crazy. And you can't say anything because you're violating my free choice. And it's like, actually, I can say something (laughs) because this is, go ahead. Yeah. But but it's like that Twitter post, you are, you are committing the greatest sin of all, which is to devalue their individualism. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you can't de devalue someone. Um, by constraining their choice. Yeah. Just, you know, well, how do, okay. Like, I guess, I guess this is what we're talking about then is, is how do people who call themselves Christians believe this? Because I mean, I guess that's part of what we're talking about is that it's been a long, slow process because the things that you and I are talking about right now, I consider like common sense. Now I know that that there's nothing common about it, and you know, we're actually driving a we're actually driving a crowbar right into these wedge points of culture. But it's like it just seems kind of obvious that this is the case, and that, that that it's the responsibility of Christians to scrutinize ideas down to their foundations and see if they can stand under the weight of the gospel. That seems to be the responsibility, and yet people aren't willing to do that, and yet they still call themselves Christians and they write for big, you know, evangelical, you know, I guess blogs or conferences or whatever. What is going on? What is, what is happening, John? Help me. Well, I mean, most of them aren't operating out of Christian teaching. Okay. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, um, as you see with like the Christian nationalism debate on social media. I mean, if you go back 150 years and read almost any Baptistic or Presbyterian pastor or theologian on the role of the state um, to suppress impiety, to uphold the two tables of God's law as public policy. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like th- these would be um, mundane and pedestrian assertions. And now, if you say that, uh, you know, like. Stephen Wolf, there's a guy on Twitter this morning and he's like, you can get Stephen Wolf's book for free right now so you can read a heretic without financially supporting him. <laughs> I, I'm, like, I'm like, the dude's a heretic. Um, it, it, what I realized a while ago is for people, especially in America, churches, pastors, Christians, um, the post World War II consensus mm-hmm. is um, all of history, all of theology, 
all of culture, all of thought ends right there. World War II. Like, yeah, they, they, they cannot, it, it's, it's like a mountain they cannot mentally traverse. Yep. Or like an impregnable wall that they can find no door to the other side through. Yeah. And so whenever I interact with these people, you know, I just realize it's like they literally cannot conceive of a world any different than the post World War II uh, political, social, industrial consensus. Um, yep. and, and and it's just you know it's with some of them it's just almost impossible to get them to even think about what an alternative world would look like uh, biblically and otherwise. You know, like, like try and tell the average Christian that um, their kids shouldn't be shipped off to colleges hundreds of thousands of miles away mm -hmm. at great expense. And, and they will look at you like you have totally lost your mind. Mm hmm I'm like, I'm like, this has been culturally normative for 40 ish years that every, you know, I'm like, and, and to you, this is like foundational reality truth, something that's completely historically not, um, you know, so it's, um, it's, it's kind of like the matrix at this point where you're, you, you, you have to find a way to get them to be able to drop out of the system and see its horror before you can then begin to rebuild them with a functional Christian worldview in a mm. postmodern world. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> as a, as one of your kids <laughs> pops in to say, hi, it's awesome. So I, I guess, I'm 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 <laughs> I'm I'm battling a couple impulses. One is to be the the put together host, and the other is to be the despairing <laughs> member of modern society. But be because it seems to me that Christianity itself should be the ultimate red pill. Like what is what is what is the what is more red pill than the Bible itself, than than the gospel, than the New Testament, or or the, the totality of Scripture? That should be the red pill. That should be the lens, the mirror that you hold up to everyone, everything and look and see at the truth of anything else. And yet it, it seems like, as you say, that many Christians today, they look at modernity and they worship that to varying degrees. And then they kind of squeeze the parts of the Bible that they like into that modernist kind of, or postmodernist kind of framework. And yet when, when men such as yourself come along and like raise up your hand and say, Hey, like you, you guys see what's going on there. It's like the men who point out the obvious truths that everyone claims to be adhering to, the men who actually say it are the ones who get tarred and feathered and, and roasted alive. Um, and that I find to be completely bizarre. I mean, not wholly unexpected. This is a fallen world and I get it. But it's that hypocrisy that seems so galling to people who hold themselves up as such moral high standards. No wonder most of America looks at Christianity and says, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jeremiah was not a popular prophet. I was reading, I think Jeremiah 16 or 17 last night. And, um, it's the, the one King says to Jeremiah, he's like, you know, give me a good word. Let, you know, um, let me know that the warriors will turn back from attacking. And Jeremiah goes, not only are they going to attack, but everybody who doesn't flee Jerusalem is going to die. But if you listen to me and you flee Jerusalem now, the man who listens to me and flees Jerusalem will live. Um, you know, so there, there's always periods of church history where um, things are inverted. So and good is called evil and evil is called good. Um, you know, the, the problem we face right now, especially is um, institutionally, there's very few institutions um, that are not compromised yes. or otherwise problematic at the moment. Um, and, and that's what makes it seem so bad because you have weak men 
who have strong institutional power. And mm. that gives them an outside influence and voice compared to their actual moral, spiritual, intellectual, and other credentials. Um, yes. But, you know, such men just don't bother me because they're, they're the court... They're the court prophets of the wicked kings that Jeremiah was talking about. You know, you can be a court prophet for a wicked king and you will get your reward. Mm -hmm. I would just, I would just add that these men who have um, institutional power, they actually, they're bought men sitting, you know, using, using power that other people have loaned to them in exchange for, in exchange for their allegiance. And there's not much substance to them at all. They just happen to be sitting in a sitting in a seat, you know that that is um, that has some power associated with it. But they're interchangeable with basically any other men who any other man who would say the magic words and, and pledge allegiance to the wrong forces. Yeah. Yep. So true. Yeah, you know. But but the great thing is, like I always tell guys, you know that the, the good news right now is. You know, it's never been easier to be a top tier guy. Yeah. Like, you know, I would, nobody would know who I was 150 years ago because everybody else would eat my Cheerios. <laughs> you know, it's like, like you've never had less competition to be a successful, uh, influential man and do good than right now. Mm -hmm. You know, because like, some of the guys are somewhere getting hormone replacement surgery. They don't even want to be guys. Um, you know, it's just like you face, uh, it's not an age where you face stiff competition. You face cultural, societal, economic, and other challenges. Um, but we've always had those. But you don't have stiff competition to really make an impact right now as a man. Um, and, and so I tell guys like you should be super excited about this opportunity because um, you're not facing giants, you know, like, like it's it's not like the World War One and World War Two generation where you have just like, you know, really amazing guys who especially the World War Two men, they totally dropped the ball when they came home from the war. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we watched the movie Midway. And, and you just see like the quality of the average man in terms of physicality, leadership, wisdom, fraternity. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, it's, it, it used to be um, seven out of 10 guys were like that. Now it's two out of 10. You only have one other guy who's like really stiff competition for you, but the two of you should become partners and just totally crush the other eight. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I want to, I, I want to uh, transition to talking a little bit about the particular ways that you fight. Um, but before we do that, I, I, I want to dig into this idea that I think a lot of men have a sense of what you're saying, that the bar is lower than ever, that the ability to be a top tier man is easier than ever, um, especially compared to our forefathers' generations. However, I can, I can imagine, and, and because I've encountered this myself, when a man tries to stand up, when a man who lives in, we'll say, enemy-occupied territory tries to stand up, especially, especially if you, in the hyper-feminized environment that we live in, when a man tries to stand up, he receives immediate force feedback from everyone around him, including potentially in many cases his wife, his pastor, his family members, right, his workplace maybe even his friends, you know, women of both sexes, let's say. And so I think that there are a lot of men, um, even single men who, who hear that. And um, I, I wonder if you could offer them some words of encouragement for the fight, because they have a sense that if they stand up to be counted, that the, the, the attempt will come very quickly to cut them down. And, yeah. um, and so as a man who yourself has stood up, um, maybe you can help talk some of the some of the men who are listening who feel themselves in that position through that shift that they'll have to make. Yeah. Well, the first thing is you can't fight all of those fights at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so if, if, um, you know, if you don't have an ultra supportive wife, if you're not part of a good church, like our church here in Kentucky, um, just fantastic in terms of a church that will not let men be bad actors, mm. but will not in any way muzzle men from being men. Mm. Um, you know, so, so if you, if you find yourself in a situation where, um, you know, like Kureen, um, in, <laughs> in the Silmarillion that you are just like surrounded by a sea of foes. Um, it, it, you can't fight in such a situation unless you just want to be a martyr. Um, so you, to be a guy who stands up, you, you have to have some bastion of support you've built up. You, you have to have some band of brothers. You have to have, um, a household or some family or some church family that supports you. So you really need to cultivate and build those things first. Um, you know, and then especially I just say like, um, it, it does start with your marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a guy who is in a uh, highly feminized marriage, then the bulk of your prayers, the bulk of your energy needs to be um, to rectify having a fundamentally dysfunctional marriage. Um, you know, one of the things I've talked about um, in some of my writing is the fact that, like, you know, in the ancient world, who was who exercised cultural, social, political influence? Well, it was the men at the city gate. Mm -hmm. um, well, how did you get to be a man at the city gate? Because like, not everybody got to be a man at the city gate. Because um, there's work to be done. You know, like, um, well, you were a man at the city gate when you had built a productive, successful household and successful assets and businesses and you had a well-trained wife and well-trained servants who could then run stuff. Because then you now had the economic, social time margin to sit at the gate. And you had accrued the wisdom. Um, you know, another way I've put this is, uh, you know, everybody wants the title of master. Mm -hmm. but, but the title of master really meant somebody who had achieved mastery, you know, like a master carpenter was somebody who had mastered carpentry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I tell men, you know, like if you, if you want to have a right to fight, you, you have to have achieved this type of mastery in numerous areas of your life. Um, cause one is you need that to have the wisdom and the resources to fight and not just shipwreck your whole life. Uh, you know, cause people are like, Oh, like, you know, you're, you're not afraid of upsetting almost anyone. I'm like, cause it's true. Cause I'm like, there's not really almost anything they can do to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't carry any debt. I live on a 35 acre farm. I have a really cute wife. If I never got invited to speak at a conference again for the rest of my life, I'd probably be happier. <laughs> you know, I just like sit here with cute little girls and read them Narnia. And, you know, it's just like, um, you know, that, that's, um, you know, that's the kind of man you need to become to be useful in the day we find ourselves. You need to have self mastery. You need to have a measure of economic independence you need to have a like-minded community, even if it's small. Um, and, and then you can start to throw, you know, jabs and hooks when appropriate and wise. Um, I'll have a talk. The talk might be available already. Um, Tim Bouchon is a pastor up in Indiana. 
And he put a conference on called Jesus and Politics. Mm -hmm. And I spoke at that last month. And I talk a bit in my talk there um, that, you know, you can't fight every fight. Uh, you know, so you see Jesus and the Gospels, um, G Jesus will fight with the best of them. You know, he, he will unleash chaos at a moment's notice. But, but that's only a small percentage of what you see him doing in the Gospels. You know, and I meet some men and they're just like, every hill is a hill to die on. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, no, man, I'm like, you know, not every hill is a hill to die on. Not every fight is your fight. And you need to be strategic and thinking about um, where you're going to expend your energy and what hills have to be defended and what hills are worth trying to reclaim. Mm. Starting from the household out, basically, the relationship with your wife, if you have one, out, or the relationship with the woman who will be your wife, if you don't have one, start from there outwards. Yeah. You know, and I'll give a quick plug for guys. If you're a guy and your marriage is not great, um, John Michael Clark has a Facebook group called The Family Captain. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a program called The Family Captain that is completely built around a biblical view of male, female, and household. Uh, that helps a lot of guys write that ship. So, hmm. you know, so if you're somebody who really needs some additional resources, uh, there's some groups and men out there who can help you because, uh, and, and, you know, this is just basic Bible. Um, it, you know, you don't get to do much else until your household is running well biblically. Um, but, you know, th th this is just what the New Testament says. Um, and, you know, secular terms like Jordan Peterson has pointed this out for years. If your own life is a mess, um, a lot of people want to get involved in problems out there because mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with the problems in here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's like the guy who has a nagging, annoying wife. So he's never home because he's always fixing other people's things or doing this or doing that. And he looks very spiritual or very productive, but he's actually avoiding the thing he really needs to be doing. He's avoiding the hard thing. Mm -hmm. I talk to men about the difference between difficult, easy, and difficult, difficult. Difficult, <laughs> easy are the things that they require some effort, but at least they're familiar and they're convenient to do and it creates the appearance. And maybe it even is work, but every man has a list of things in his life that are actually difficult, difficult, that'll be difficult, unfamiliar, perhaps even high stakes, high impact that he avoids doing in favor of the difficult, easy things. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the particular, the particular hills that you fight on. Um, you started out mentioning that 350 pound elephants, plural in the room, um, but I, I know that you're focused on food and sovereignty and jujitsu and speaking up against the corruption of Christian culture. Let's start. I, I want to start talking about food um, because I've listened to a number of your talks and I've li listened to you talk about your buying club and I've listened to you talk about uh, the threats that have been made against you. And of course, I know that, you know, talking about food and nutrition and fitness are some of the most controversial topics in America today. But to lead into that, I, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about your testimony first, because it feeds into some of these pieces. Yeah. So um, I grew up Northeast Ohio, standard middle class, rust belt, um, city inhabitant. Um, the, my um, you know, typical divorced family growing up, um, mm. all you know, just very, very typical 1980s. 1990s type childhood <clears throat> and um uh my mom was diagnosed with cancer my junior year of high school um she passed away my freshman year of college sorry and the lord saved me my sophomore year of college oh wow um and so 
I ended up being sent to seminary after college by my local association of churches. I get to seminary and, um, you know, I grew up moderately Catholic, went to a Catholic school for a number of years when I was a kid. Uh, I was an altar boy for a number of years, mostly because I got paid to go to church <laughs> and I could wear, instead of having to get dressed up in dress clothes for church underneath my cassock. I could wear like shorts and a t-shirt. It's like, this is great. <laughs> Score. I get paid to go to church sometimes and I don't have to get dressed up. Like what more does a young boy want? Um, and so, uh, Lord saves me. I go to seminary. Everything's new to me. Um, uh, you know, cause I, again, I didn't grow up in Christian culture. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in evangelical circles. Um, I grew up listening to Bon Jovi and Metallica, not <laughs> listening to Michael W. Smith and all of these other, and I'm Carmen. Remember when I was first introduced to Carmen? And I'm like, this is what I was listening to in the 80s and 90s. And this is what these people were listening to. I don't even know who that <laughs> is. <laughs> well, dude, oh, dude, you man. should look up Carmen on YouTube. It Carmen. is, it is hysterical look into 1980s pop Christian culture. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. You're going to be in for a treat. Pop okay. some popcorn. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, I showed my kids some of the videos of Carmen a couple years ago, and they were like a mixture of fascination and horror. <laughs> ultra, ultra uh, cringe. <laughs> like a train wreck. Can't look away from it. And, uh, you know, so while I was in seminary, I got super, super sick. Mm. Um, but, you know, like I, I'm at a fundamental level building a view of reality. So I'm reading like Francis Schaeffer and other and, and theologians and stuff. And, um, and so when I went into the doctor, you know, they finally figured out I had duodenal ulcers. Uh, duodenum's the thing that attaches your stomach to your intestines. Mm-hmm. And an ulcer is when the protective lining um, breaks down. So stomach acid starts hitting your own tissues instead of the protective lining of bacteria and yeast and other microorganisms um, that neutralize the acid. And that then, as it hits your bare tissues, eats away at them. Um, so if you've ever had a, a bad kind of painful scab, Mm -hmm. On the outside of your body, uh, a duodenal ulcer is having that on the inside of your body. Ouch. It's like way, 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 way worse. Terribly worse. Uh, so I go to the doctor. and The doctor's like, yeah, you have duodenal ulcers. We'll, um, we'll put you on this drug. And I look at the doctor and I go, well, what does this drug do? And the doctor goes, well, uh, it shuts off your body's ability to produce hydrochloric acid. And, and this right here shows you the disconnect in how most Christians think about things. Um, I'll have a talk coming out in another month um, from at C.R. Wiley's church. He's great. And Joel Salatin and I gave three talks. Joel gave two, I gave one. That if you're a listener and you want a deep dive into this type of thinking as a Christian, um, C.R. Wiley said that my talk should be required listening for anyone who calls themselves reformed in America. Link in the show notes. Um, well, it won't be out for a while because I think it goes on Canon first and then it'll go on their YouTube. Um, and so I, I look at the doctor and I go, what will happen to my body if you make it stop doing something it was designed to do. And the doctor looks at me and he goes, he goes, um, honestly, he goes, in all of my years of medicine, nobody has ever asked me this question. And he goes, I've honestly never thought this question myself. This question... <laughs> and, um, uh, you, you know, so, so like, again, you know, like, um, 
so you, you think of like the intelligent design movement in the early 2000s. We have all of these Christians like, you know, God is the great designer. Now let me eat food out of a clown head. Um, yes. You know, fiat let food. Me, you, you know, it's just um, so. You, you know, one of the things I realized fundamentally about modern Christians is they live in open hostility with almost all of their truth claims. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I remember years ago I met a guy, and he wasn't much older than me at that time. And so, you know, so like at the time I was like 35, 36. And so this dude was like 39, maybe 40. And he was going in for back fusion surgery. Mm. And I'm, I'm like, why are you going in for back? He's like, I just have a lot of back pain from sitting all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I'm like, so so why don't you quit sitting? Why don't you build a standing? And he, he looked at me like I was an alien. Uh, so here's a 40-year-old guy getting his back fused who claims to be a Christian who needs his back fused because he refuses to use his body according to the instruction manual. Right. And his body is telling him that he's not using it according to the instruction manual through pain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like this quote from um, the guy who wrote on becoming a supple leopard, but he goes, pain is, is the body's request for change. Right. Um, you know, pain is how your body requests that you make a change. Mm-hmm. Got it. To something you're doing, you know. Um, but most Christians just see pain as an annoyance to be medicated away and ignored. Yep. Um, so, so uh, you know, so this is like the weird world I've lived in for two decades where it's all of these unbelievers I'm friends with who are trying to figure out the body's design. How do you live with the body's design? How do you optimize the body's design? who actually believe there is a design and a blueprint for the human body and human health. And they're studying it and they're trying to figure out and they're trying to apply it. But none of them believe in a designer. Yep. None of them believe, you know, they're like, they're evolutionists, you know, so, so none of them have a reason to believe in design, but they're, and, and then I go to Christians who say they're a designer and it's the fourth potluck of the month. <laughs> And we're eating off styrofoam plates and drinking Coca-Cola. And half of the church has metabolic diseases. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm just like, you know, like, oh, goodness. Like, you know, so, sometimes I just have to be, you know, just, just trust that eventually the ship will right. I, I, I'm so glad you said that because I spent 20 years in the New Age before coming to Christ. And one thing that the new age, like, believe it or not, gets a, a few things right. One of the things that it gets right is the emphasis on, on um, anti-modern approach to food and a focus on holistic health. And also, uh, which is huge. Like you find people that are into natural fibers and, you know, yeah. being, you know, being more careful with electromagnetic radiation and, you know, single ingredient, you know, real foods and, and, you know, th obviously they can go way off the deep end with a lot of it, you know, for sure. Right. Because there's no, there's no guardrails and to, con and, and to, to see this and to, to know that in uh, Christendom is absolutely abdicated on this topic. Totally. Like one thousand percent, just put it into the hand of secularists and oneists, is is the strangest thing. And when you try and raise the issue, the pushback that comes is is insane. And I've been trying to figure it out. Like, is this Gnosticism? Maybe. Is it like the sin of Americanism? Probably. Is it an overemphasis on comfort? Definitely. But to begin talking about some of these subjects and to recognize that, like you said, it's rooted in a, a, a designed being having a designer and producing a manual that told us how to live. And if we follow it, things go better for us. And Christians seem to believe that, so to speak. 
and all these different socio social and cultural ways, like the best of the reform tradition, let's say, and yet they can't ground it onto their plate and into their kitchens. Why? Yeah. <laughs> what is going on? Well, I mean, you see this back in the sixties and seventies when like um baby formula was created. Uh. <laughs> and you know, there, there are Christians right now, um, pastors who will not say that breastfeeding is the it is a motherly duty that God designed them for. What? For fear of upset, you know, because like some mothers don't produce enough milk or this, that, or the other. Cope. You, you know, and I'm just like, like, you know, again, like you can look at a woman and see this was a task she was literally hand designed for. <laughs> yes. And you're not even willing to say that because you're afraid to upset them. Yes. Um, you know, so so if we won't, if we won't defend obvious truths. We're definitely not going to defend hard truths, right? And and one of the things that I say in, in parallel to that is, you know, men, reform men, post millennial men, sure, will say we need to take dominion. Great, yes, yeah. thousand per, thousand percent on board. Take dominion of politics and the public square and all that. Uh, so, so it's so great all the children that are coming in and out of the frame during this. The people listening can't see it, but there's just several of your kids wandering in and out, being handed in and out. It's great. Um, but it, I this tell them the sleepy. <laughs> this is the sleepy one. Yeah, um, he just woke up from his nap. He'll see he's on camera for a second. And it'll be and that'll be fun. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when you tell them like, okay, are you ready to take dominion over your kitchen? Are you ready to start telling your wife what she can and can't buy and can and can't cooked cook? Like, are you ready to start saying, this is how the family is going to eat. This is how I'm going to eat. And this is not a negotiation. And you, and you watch them just like buckle, you know? And it's like, how can you, how can you begin as we talked about, you know, Jordan Peterson, who was destroyed for saying something so basic as clean your room, you know what I mean? Start taking, you know, in his own way, take dominion over his life, though he wouldn't use that language. It's like, yeah, okay, it's really like it's really great to talk about the public square, but if you can't handle your dinner table, what do you do? What are you doing? Yeah, if you don't have authority over your own home, how on earth do you think you're gonna exercise authority anywhere else? Right. So so you so we we got derailed to the um you had the duodenal ulcer and uh and so maybe pick pick up the story from from there. Yeah, so I was fortunate I had a professor who had had some health issues a couple years before who put my then fiance, my now wife Jessica and I, um, you know, on the rabbit hole path. Mm -hmm. Introduced us to a lady by Sue Gregg. Sue Gregg introduced us to the work of Sally Fallon, who introduced us to the work of Weston A. Price. Okay. Um, Weston A. Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Mm. Um, you can read it online for free as a PDF. Okay. So I think it was written in like the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very old book. The pictures in that book alone are worth reading the book for. Because uh, he, he was a dentist in the early 1900s. And you know, so he's seeing families mm -hmm. and they will be first child, beautiful dental arches. A smile, <laughs> nicely spaced teeth. Yeah. Second child, beautiful dental arches, nicely spaced teeth. Second child subtly starts to have dental cavities. Third child, crowded teeth in the palate. So over the course of a decade and a half or so, he is in real time watching the physiological developmental collapse of his American dental patients. Hmm. And he goes, why is this happening? Um, so he went all over the world. He took like 10 or 11 trips. Again, the picture... He has pictures of everywhere he went in the world um, exploring what creates healthy people and what does not. 
and, and the book is just an absolutely fascinating um, read and exposure to a man who really believed there was a designer mm -hmm. and was looking for the principles that underlined how you supported and worked with the design rather than against it. Um, so, so we get exposed to them. Um, we completely reformed, you know, what we considered food, how we prepared food and where we got food from over the course of a couple of years mm -hmm. um, and became the very crazy people that we now are today. <laughs> Yes, as everyone as everyone can hear, cra crazy uh, because you believe the truth. Um, so so the, well, crazy because I don't eat like out of clown heads. <laughs> I avoid seed oils to a large degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think styrofoam and plastic plates and silverware are a scourge, not a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it all it all feeds in. It all feeds into this how do I put this? It's like the industrialization commercialization of the home. Like I was aware that the industrial revolution, one of the main effects of it was to take the father out of the home. That's been pretty well, pretty well documented as a big problem. But what isn't often discussed is how the industrial revolution re removed productive labor from the home as well. So like, whereas the wife would, you know, typically be making the clothes, then you had textile factories and whereas, uh, whereas wife would be, you know, making, making bread, you had all these brands, you know, start springing up, especially in the first half of the 20th century. That's another phenomenon that, uh, one of the most influential books I've ever read is E. Michael Jones, Libido Dominandi, where he talks about, you know, sort of what happened to the American family. And so to begin taking apart these, like the way that both men and women have been so deeply impacted by the industrial revolution and winding that back. It, I mean, like that, that almost seems like the thing that you're not supposed to question. Like, you know, maybe yeah, I, I have a quote. I don't know if you've heard this one before, um, but I pulled it up because I think you're going to like it. Okay. Hit me. Um, so it says gone from the home were the array of activities that defined the substance family economy, okay. sewing, canning, baking, laundering, most cooking, health care care for the elderly, security, education, amusement, recreation, religious activities. All had been passed or were passing to industrially organized entities, be they corporate, state, or charitable in nature. American homes were merely parking places for parents and children who spent their active hours elsewhere. Where do you think that quote is from? And when do you think it is? from? I think that quote is uh, from like 1910 and might be from Weston A. Price. Yeah. So this is 1933. Okay. And it is President Herbert Hoover's. Really? Um, Report on social trends. So it was a 40 year look at the changes sweeping the American nation. And at the heart of this report is this discussion of the radical change to the responsibilities and functions of a household. Because mm -hmm. you know, it's like, um, what was a function of the household? Security, amusement, mm -hmm. recreation, religious activities. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the home, um, you know, conservative people are always like, well, well, how do we limit? Um, how do we keep government power limited? How do we not have such powerful corporations? Well, but if you, if you look at how creation is ordered, um, th there's a set amount of power mm -hmm. and if it does not flow to the proper institution, somebody is going to come along and gobble up that power and influence. The power and influence is not going to cease to be. Mm -hmm. So like the power of entertainment, 
Herbert, th- this report on social trends notes, that was the dominion of the household and the community. But that was ceded to industrially organized entities. Um, and so you can't fix, uh, you know, this, this is why a lot of my effort is around trying to get people to realize there is no replacement for productive, multi-generational, geographically tightly located households. Um, the reason government and corporations want your kids to go off to college, want them to go get a job halfway across the country is because all of the functions and resources that you all would have had shared, which begin to cut them out of the equation, you're now all all, um, reduced to isolated consumers. You know, when when you lived next door or down the street from mom and dad, you had babysitting. You had Uber Eats for when your family had the flu. Mm -hmm. You had counseling for when things got a little bit rough in your marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a writer on um, Twitter, a really interesting girl by the name of Mega, I think she spells it like M E G H A. Mega Verma, I think, right? Um, yeah, you know, she's like Indian, maybe, um, mm-hmm. or Middle Eastern. But she pointed out in one of her posts recently that so many of the problems in modern marriages is the marriages are stripped from any really meaningful community setting, where the the immaturity and bad behavior of either party would be checked by extended family. Amen. Yep. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, you know, so a lot of my work has been, you know, food and household food, because you can't build a productive household if you can't have kids and you're weak and sick. Mm -hmm. Um, you just can't do it, you know? So, our churches being overran by disease and overweightness and, you know, like all of these problems, um, you can't go to war with a sick army. Um, you know, you, you can't <laughs> yeah. accomplish, you know, um, Nehemiah and Ezra aren't rebuilding Jerusalem with people who get winded going up two flights of stairs. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you need robustly healthy people. Yes, they have to be spiritually healthy, but we put all the emphasis on spiritual health and nobody wants to talk about physical health anymore. Uh, but, but I'm like, you know, large numbers of people in our churches can't even have kids anymore. They're so unhealthy. Yeah. Their hormones and other things are so jacked up. So you can't even fulfill basic biblical commands of being fruitful and multiplying. And you're going to think you're going to fulfill other commands. I'm just taking, I'm just like that quote that that Herbert Hoover quote, like what it's helping me see is that maybe the threads that have ripped apart America that I mentioned earlier maybe what they've really been doing has been in, in industrially ripping apart the home, the, the ripping apart, ripping the way the kids, the father, you know, entertainment, food production, all these different things. It's torn all of these pieces out of the productive household and, and disperse them into institutions. And yeah. the struggle that we're facing right now, I think is that baby boomers grew up in an era where they had just prosperity poured down upon them with little to no effort on their part, right? Like they, they, they switched. Uh, I'm going to do a whole series of tweets about this. You know, the, the generation that was most concerned about quote unquote selling out sold out for trillions of dollars out of the money printer starting in the seventies and eighties, right? Like, yeah, you were concerned about selling out, selling out. You sold out for the most money in history. Congratulations. 
but the boomers are the ones who are defending the institutions with every yeah. last shred and fiber of their being. And to try and say that like, this is destroying everything. Like, what do you mean? It worked for me. Why would they lie? Is the most, <laughs> you know what I mean? I see, I see yeah. that you've encountered this as well. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, um, w with a lot of men in that situation, I'm to the point of let the dead bury their own dead. <laughs> um, wow. You know, it's just, I, I don't, the, again, it's, it's like with, again, cause a lot of the boomers, all of all that is good in world history starts with post World War II. Yes, you know, except their, their fathers. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's just, um, yeah, it just is, is what it is. So, so the work that you've been doing has been to um, reintegrate a lot of these fragmented portions of the home, right? That has been institutionalized. Oh, real quick about that Hoover, Herbert Hoover quote. When did you discover it? And what was the tone of the paper that it was written in? Was it like approving? Was it like the Moynihan report? Was it a warning? Was it like what happened to the paper itself? Well, well, the, the 1933 President's Report on Social Trends, Hoover is the one who wanted the report made. Okay. Um, and it was a whole bunch of researchers. It's um, I think you can look it up on archive.org. Okay. And I think it might be 500 some pages. Yikes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's very giant. government. Okay. Um, and so the author who wrote this particular segment, um, I first heard about this through Alan Carlson. Okay. The family, um, the, the family cycles guy. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, um, my friend Daryl Dow said of Alan Carlson, there is nothing that man has written that isn't worth reading. Okay. Um, so Carlson has a number of great books. Um, and so Carlson is really like, in terms of Christians, one of the leading researchers and thinkers on, especially from like history, sociology, other stuff. Um, just one of the leading figures in America on this subject. Um, if you want to be exposed to history, whole bunch of other stuff, there's really no replacement for Carlson. Okay. Um, and so he has a number of books. Um, you know, so the guy who wrote that section, um, when I read a little bit of his other writing, um, you know, it's it's hard for me to say it struck me as mild concern. Okay. Uh, and you can even <laughs> feel that, you know, a little bit in the quote, you know, homes had became parking lots. Mm. Parking lots are not a positive comparison to That's use. Um, so I think to the guy who did that particular section of the report, how industrialization and cultural changes were undermining um, the integrity of households was a concern. Mm -hmm. um, because again, like all of these functions have to be picked up somewhere. Right. Um, and now they're picked up poorly by other institutions um, that we have to pay, you know, mm -hmm. to perform such functions and to perform them poorly that we even have to pay through taxation because of government subsidies. Like we don't have a choice whether or not to pay them. They've taken them yeah. on and, and, and institutional governmental taxation power has decided that they're going to force us to pay for the privilege of being poisoned. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Or the privilege of being protected by police. Yeah. Um, you know, so like security education is now public schools. Um, it, you know, so it's, it, if you go through that list, almost every single function of the household has now been replaced by a government agency or a corporate business, mm -hmm. um, including religious activities, yep. which now have been replaced by modern infotainment churches. Oh, <laughs> let's go. 
That's it, it's. I'm glad you said that because um, I have a friend who I've known for about ten years, and uh, he he's also exiting out of the new age world as I did. And so um, one of the other things that the new age gets right is that it's a constant. Anyone who gets involved in it generally is involved in constant discussions about theology. The theology is wrong, but at least you have to understand the different worldviews that you're encountering and know how to syncretize them into your own particular personal religion. So you have to do the exercise. And so now he's considering Christianity. And so he, he has friends that are pulling him in the Eastern Orthodox direction and the Roman Catholic direction. And so he's contacting me, helping to sort out all, all these things because he goes into the Jesus is my boyfriend laser light show, you know, pirate oh, yeah. ship Baptist church. And is like that, I don't know much about Christianity, but that doesn't seem like it, bro. I'm like, I, I know. Yeah. And I'm having to explain these, these trends to him. Like, well, this is kind of how we got this and this is why they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. Just, <laughs> Well, it helps to have 10 years of relationship equity built with the guy to, to work through some of these subjects. But okay, so so as you're you're reading this Herbert Hoover quote, which I think I heard you say you got from Alan Carlson is where you first in, encountered that. And so yep. like was this along the road where you had started putting things back together yourself? Because I can feel like just the way that quote is working its way through me right now is radicalizing me more than I already have been because I can finally see the nature of the problem is to reintegrate all these disintegrated portions of the household. So was that, was that an inspiration for you? Like, was it a big part of your journey or were you already along the road of doing that when you encounter that and said, yes, that's already what I've been doing? No, um, C.R. Wiley exposed me to this quote maybe two years ago. Oh, okay. Well, I was, you know, because of Francis Schaeffer and some other influences, um, we were already far along this road. Got it. Well, but that quote was like a um, like a linchpin or a belt buckle. Mm-hmm. I'm like that quote really because again, it's timing. Because you know, that social report, I believe, was covering forty or so years. So that report mm-hmm. was looking at America from like the 1880s to 1930, roughly. Okay, big transition. Um, and. And, you know, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to understand a number of these big transition pieces in American history and what drove them and kind of got us here to Mm -hmm. then, you know, how do we navigate, um, you know, like if you're lost in the ocean, you have to find your bearings before you can set a new course. Um, so I always wanted to figure out, you know, like this is um, roughly where are we and why? Mm-hmm. And then how do we begin to navigate to better waters again? Got it. Okay. So so um, I want to focus on your work with your buying club and your work with food, but I want to I want to put a bow on the discussion of of the encountering of um, of these ideas. Um, that any man who goes seriously walking down the path of, let's say, personal sanctification, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, right living, nutrition, fitness, all these things, you will eventually come to this this crossroads, which I, I feel very much in that Herbert Hoover quote, like it is, a, it is a crossroads, it is a belt buckle, it is a linchpin that's tying together a bunch of different threads. So witnessing this, and and feeling that quote and witnessing the the gravity of the situation and then moving into the contemporary Christian dialogue and attempting to explain to them whether or not you know it, you are advocating for this, we'll call it broadly post-war consensus that has this fragmented household and attempting to assert a counter position of a more integrated Christian productive household and that conflict and what it has to do with fathers and masculinity, right? That seems to be the piece of all of it, because the father is the center of gravity that holds all of those things together within the home. And then, and so what has been the, the reaction? I, I mean, I know, but the reaction of the, of the public of men in uh, men behind the scenes at the conferences that you speak at men on Twitter to these ideas that you're, I guess, embodying, like providing an example, here's one way to put the pieces back together. And so you encounter friction on Twitter. What's the response? I guess I would say, that Christian men have behind the scenes talking to you 
maybe they're not willing to express support on Twitter, but do you find that the message is being received in the work that you do traveling and speaking at conferences? Oh yeah. Like, um, last Friday, me and my son ran up to Louisville, do some errands and then went to a, uh, black Friday jujitsu open mat roll. So like mm. 10 different dojos, all sorts of guys show up. You just roll and fight until mm -hmm. you can't roll and fight no more until you're too tired. <laughs> um, and I walk in and there's a dude who follows me on Twitter, never met him in person. And he's like, Hey man, it's like, I just want to tell you, um, just how much your posts have benefited me and my wife. Um, Praise you know, God. like these are the things we're doing because of your writing, your speaking. Um, it's just been so great for us. This is the small business we're starting that we're hoping will let us get out of the corporate rat race. Um, and then like a day later, somebody sent me a private message on Facebook. There's basically two paragraphs of the same thing. Like, Hey man, you've never met me. He goes, but I, I want to tell you like just how much you've helped us build a good household hmm. um, through your example. And then through teaching and writing and other stuff you're doing. Um, you know, so you get naysayers and you get pushback. Um, but you get a lot of people who are just like, yeah, man, like let's roll, you know, let's, cause a lot of younger guys, um, they, it, Schaefer talks about this, that, um, he has a quote in one of his books. He's like, you know, um, for all of their apparent differences, the leftist hippie mm -hmm. and the buttoned up um, conservative um, suburban mom and dad, mm. they actually hold to the same worldview. This is Schaefer in the 70s. Mm. And he goes, both of them, above all else, value personal peace and affluence as the, uh, you know, so, so Schaefer's writing, it's in his trilogy. This quote is, I believe, um, that section on, um, you know, the 30 and 40 year olds in the seventies and eighties and what, um, you, you know, I mean, I mean, this is why I grew up thinking the greatest threats in the world to me were catching on fire, quicksand, banana peels. And I, like, it, it, it was just a generation, uh, it, you know, and, and Schaefer uses the word peace. He's not using it in the biblical sense. Right. He's really using it in the sense of like um, personal safety and lack of conflict. Mm-hmm you know, lack of social and other conflict and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, that quote from Schaefer really helped me understand why the, the children of those parents mm -hmm. have rebelled in, in very strident ways. At least, you know, in the parents' view, they're rebelling. Um, some are rebelling, the ones who are going even farther into nonsense and insanity. But what some of us are doing is we're not rebelling. We're just going backwards. Right. You know, it's like, no, like um, the, the um, you know, there's a father of a girl I know years ago was talking with him. And, and and he really encapsulated in this this mindset in a conversation I had with him because uh, he was unhappy that his daughter wanted to be a wife and a mother. Mm. And in justifying why he was unhappy, he said, you know, he goes, well, me and my wife sacrificed so much so that our daughters could go to college so they could have a better life. But, but what does he mean by a better life? Well, what they mean by a better life is more social standing, more security, and more stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Like that is the better life of the boomer. It's, it's not greater biblical fidelity. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, as the proverb says, better is little where there is joy than much where there is strife. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, um, and this was a supposedly very overtly pious and Christian man. But his entire value system, as Schaefer pointed out, was totally built around personal peace and prosperity. How do we, how do we crack that? Is it possible beyond the move of the, of the Holy Spirit? Right. Well, no, I mean, like, like, um, again, like the younger generation in God's providence is really open to this, mm -hmm. um, because they see the emptiness, you know, th they were raised by dads who were almost completely absent for their childhoods. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe this would be a great story to tell. Um, I used to run my own private tutoring business. And I was tutoring an older sister of a younger brother. And the mother's like, hey, she's like, um, I want you to work with my other, my one son, you know, so-and-so's younger brother. He is, his teachers say he's having trouble in school. So I start to work with this boy. And after like four sessions, I'm like, this kid does not need me at all. Mm -hmm. this kid is a genius. Mm -hmm. Like none of these subjects are actually hard for him. Um, so I wait a couple more sessions to build up some relational rapport with this kid. And um, when students would work really hard, I'd reward them. Um, we'd play ping pong at the end of tutoring. And so we're probably playing ping pong. And I finally look at him and I go, man, I go, why are you here? I go, you know that you do not need my help. And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, um, you know, he's like, he's like, John, he's like, why do I need to work hard in school? Well, I need to work hard in school so that I can go to a good college. Well, why do I need to go to a good college? Well, the, so that's so I can get a really high paying job. Well, why do I need to get a really high paying job, John? Um, well, that's so that um, I can have to work all the time to buy a really big house and a bunch of cars so that people like me. And so that I can have a family that I'll never see because I'm always at work and be around people I don't even like because they only like me for my achievements in my assets. And he goes, he goes, I don't want what my parents are offering. Hmm. But like, like that right there is, it was like seeing Schaefer's writing in real time because his parents were the peace and prosperity is the heart of our worldview. And the son was just like, and it's an empty idol that's yeah. actually worthless. Um, so, so you're getting a lot of men who are animated by the idea of building biblically faithful households and that prosperity is a means to God's glory. It's a mean to um, undermining the idols and institutions of our day that stand against Christ and the spread of his kingdom and gospel. Um, and, and so I'm all, you know, so I'm generally encouraged that more and more men and families um, are beginning to see and understand this. Um, again, because, you know, they, they grew up with absentee parents. Yeah. You know, and, and they're just like, dad, what's the point of working 60 hours a week for, um, you know, in today's money, a half a million dollar home that most of us are in for not even eight hours a night. Right. 
you know, what's, what's the point, dad? And, and the parents could never explain to them why this was the way to go. Um, you, you know, so, so the, the materialistic consumptive worldview um, gives an opportunity to present an alternative. And the alternative can be very compelling. I'd just like to take a moment to personally thank you for saying all that because you just put words to my experience of childhood, my own personal journey. It took me much longer than a ping pong game to, uh, to come to those realizations, but they were hard fought and uh, I hadn't put words to all of them, but it essentially describes my life arc. And so I'm grateful to hear that. Um, I knew intuitively that the perspective was shared. Of course, I have lots of men and, and women, you know, uh, who I interact with and communicate with and who are around me who are on the same journey, but to hear it put so concisely um, is, um, is very moving for me because I've come to these, I've come to these own lessons on my own um, and through the influence of, of men and books uh, myself and, and no small amount of the Holy Spirit. So thank you very much for, putting words to that. It's, it's very powerful for me to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Sorry. I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. That's completely fine. I, I have plenty of resources of yours to, uh, to send men to, but, um, where would you like to send men to find out more about you and what you do? Um, I have a gab and I have a 1984 Facebook account still. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, and if it works out, we might start a podcast for next year. Um, mm. that's going to really be all about nuts and bolts of building productive households. Um, and, you know, really going over, um, you know, things you do with your kids, things you do with your wife, things you do with your land. Um, how do you acquire different skill sets? What skill sets are valuable? Um, how those skill sets can then transfer to helping your sons find vocations. Um, so we're really excited if we can get the stars to align and get that moved along. I think you would find that to be a, a very successful and profitable endeavor for sure. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what the Lord has in store for next year. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your family's time as well. It's been great <laughs> sharing this uh, sharing this this conversation with uh, with the group of you. So thank thank you so much, John. Great. Well, I look forward to when we talk again, brother. Have a wonderful day. Me too. God bless.